I'm so nervous that this is. Breathe. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right. This is for you. You can do anything. You can edit it. You can do whatever you like, you know? Yay. Okay. Yay. It looks like uh, success. <laughs> awesome. Okay. It says live. But I okay. don't see recording, so you may want to re yep. record. Yeah, we're it's all going out. Uh, it's all going out live to the world now. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining me for this very special episode um, with Dr. Stephen Hassan. I, as many of you have probably noticed at this point, this is my first time going live, so I'm just you know, a novice at this. I but just want to check, Yasmin, are we recording yet? Yep. It's being it's going I'm live on YouTube. It. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, it'll be I haven't done it there. either on YouTube. So forgive me for interrupting. No, no worries. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everything will go well. Um, so Dr. Stephen Hassan is a mental health professional and expert in undue influence tactics used by authoritarian leaders and destructive cults. His expertise includes harmful influence in cases of destructive religious and political cults, human trafficking, extremist and terrorist groups, one-on-one -on -one relationships, families, parental alienation, mini cults, therapy, self-improvement groups, professional and institutional abuse, corporate and multi-level marketing programs, and harmful belief systems. He is the author of four books, including Combating Cult Mind Control, which we will be talking about a lot in this uh, episode, Freedom of Mind, and The Cult of Trump. He is a translated author with 10 books in 10 languages, or sorry, with, with books in 10 languages. Uh, his online video courses are Understanding Cults, The Basics, Understanding Cults, A Foundational Course for Clinicians. And he is the founding director of the Freedom of Mind Resource Center, which provides training, consulting, and support to individuals who are struggling to leave or to recover from a cult, and to families and organizations that are concerned about cult behaviors. Welcome, Dr. Stephen Hassan. Thank you so much, Yasmin. It's it's a pleasure and an honor to, to meet you. This is the first time we're talking to each other other than email. So yeah. I'm psyched uh, and yeah. ready for your questions. And awesome. you're going to come on my podcast. Absolutely. The Influence Continuum. So. Absolutely. Because we're I've got so many questions. I know we're not going to get through them all today, but I'm going to try my best. Um, so I wanted to start off with talking about your book, Combating Cult Mind Control, because it begins with a dedication that says, to people all over the world who have ever experienced the loss of their personal freedom, in the hope that it might ease their suffering. And that spoke to me, as I'm sure it speaks to so many people who feel like, oh, he dedicated this book to me. Like, it just felt like that was for me. Um, and as soon as I posted on my social media that you were going to be coming on, I had some people contact me, ex-Muslims contact me. And in fact, one of them was a client at Free Hearts, Free Minds, which is my organization, similar to Freedom of Minds. I love that we've got similar names. Um, so she's from Egypt. And she said that your book was one of the first books that she read when she was leaving Islam. And she talked about how, you know, she felt like Islam fit like a glove with the bite model. And she was just so excited. I know she's here watching us right now. Um, and so, yeah, so your book just speaks to, to so many of us. And I wanted to ask you about your personal experience with cult mind control. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, my book first came out in 1988 uh, with two T's because it was simultaneously published in the UK and they like two T's. Mm -hmm. And it needed to be updated. And it took me 27 years to buy the rights back. And then I updated it because it was written way before the internet. And so many things had changed. And I added people born into undue influence and authoritarian mm -hmm. cults and trafficking and extremist groups and online recruitment. Very briefly, um, 
I'm an old fogey. I'm 68 years old. But when I was 19 and I thought I knew everything, I was a creative writing major uh, at Queens College in New York City. And I'll add, I grew up 1.3 miles from Donald Trump, but he was in the wealthy part across, across the way. Um, and my story is, uh, I was raised a conservative Jew, um, not looking to join anything, liked writing poetry, liked playing basketball, liked going out with girls. And I thought of my future as maybe getting a master's in teaching English or creative writing. Um, but my girlfriend abruptly dumped me and I was blue and I was at the cafeteria and three women flirted with me, lied to me and said they were students, lied to me and they said they weren't part of a religious group. But long story short, I was deceptively recruited and indoctrinated into the moon cult, the Moonies, uh, that, and they have hundreds of different names, but the head of it, who's now deceased, Sun Myung Moon, claimed to be the Messiah, claimed that Mohammed had been, blessed him in the spirit world, and Jesus came and asked him to finish his mission and the the group was going to change the world and establish the garden of eden and on earth and essentially i underwent a mind control experience but the tricky thing was i didn't understand what was happening to my mind mm -hmm. and and now in retrospect my mind was hacked you know and yeah and 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 for me i was chosen maybe because i'm six feet tall maybe because i had a lot of hair then uh maybe because i was a good speaker but i was chosen by the leadership to be a leader and personally groomed and moon would have us uh, leaders in these private meetings where he'd talk about how democracy was satanic and how we need a theocracy to rule the world and how we were going to infil uh, infiltrate Congress and control the government. And I thought I was going to, you know, save the world. Uh, I fell asleep at the wheel of a fundraising van two and a half years later and needed to be rescued by emergency technicians because I had driven into the back of a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour and was in insane amounts of pain. Um, and But it led me to the hospital away from the group, away from the constant indoctrination. I should add, I was sleeping three to four hours a night, seven days a week, worked for no pay. But it was in that context of being in the hospital that the real me reached out to my sister, Thea, who had never said I was an occult or brainwashed, unlike my older sister, Stephanie, or my parents, who said I was an occult. So they were satanic. And I was instructed to, you know, keep myself pure and keep these evil spirits away from me and not tell my family where I was. Long story short, my sister said, come, you have a nephew you haven't met. I'll take care of you. And I made a promise not to tell my parents because we were afraid of deprogramming. But in fact, she told my parents and, and there I was. They took my crutches away and they said, we want to talk to you about your involvement with the Unification Church. And I was started chanting, crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to heaven, peace on earth uh, over and over again, because that's called thought stopping, by the way, yep. it's a specific behavior mod technique that many cults use, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to keep myself pure and centered, etc. But the, the turning point for me um, was my father said, how would you feel if you were, it was your son, your only child, you know, your only son, who met a group of people and disappeared, met a controversial group and moved out. How would you feel? And he started to cry. And my father's mm. the old school, you know, men don't cry thing. And it touched my heart. And for a moment, I stepped into his shoes and imagined two and a, the last two and a half years, what it would feel like to be a father whose son had a radical personality change and dropped out of school. 
And I said, I'd probably be doing what you're doing now. Of course, as a Mooney, I had been brainwashed. That it was the communist media that had programmed him against father and the unification church. But I was so confident. You have to understand this. I was a fanatic. I was mm -hmm. such a good member and leader that I thought nobody can talk me out of following God. I'll throw my father a bone and listen to these people for five days. And I made him promise to drive me back at the end of five days. But fortunately, the lights turned on. And there were several key things that I'll just mention briefly before we move on. But in the Moonies, Chinese communism and Russian communism was Satan. Like we were God, they were, mm. they were atheists, they were satanic. So when I was asked, would I be interested in learning about Chinese communist brainwashing? I was like, absolutely, tell me about it. And they used Robert J. Lifton's book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, where in chapter 22, he outlines eight criteria. And I'll just say for your listeners that I he changed my life. I had a long relationship. He's still alive. And I have actual interviews with him in his 90s. And he's still very sharp and has written about cults, in fact. In any case, I went through the criteria and I was like, wait a minute. Satan does all these things, mm -hmm. but we do all these things. Mm -hmm. That still wasn't enough to open my, my brain. The thing that got me to open my brain was the next day, they handed me a speech printed by the cult and said, what do you think about this? And it was a speech where printed by the cult uh, where Moon was talking to senators and congressmen saying how much he respected Americans and how surprised he is that anyone could imagine that a Korean could brainwash a fine American mind. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know your answer is no. My answer is no, too. And for the first time in two and a half years, I thought, what a liar. Because mm -hmm. I had heard him at least 100 times in person talk about how stupid and disgusting Americans were and how unspiritual we were, blah, blah, blah. But just connecting the dots with brainwashing and that I had followed this man who I thought was the Messiah, but he was a liar. So as soon as I had that thought, it was like, that means I can't trust him. That means he can't be a representative of God. What have I been doing? And then I just cried for three hours. Yeah, and the rest was... is history. I mean, it's yeah. been 46 years. I wound up uh, going, getting my master's, becoming a mental health professional, writing, you know, several books. I just finished a doctorate in 2020 because I wanted to create a, an update for the legal system uh, to understand undue influence in any mm -hmm. context where people can look at the influence continuum and the bite model behavior control, information, thought, and emotional control, look at the variables like sleep deprivation, privacy deprivation, clothing control, needing to ask permission for major. And you, you can go through the, each one of those yeah. categories and they overlap and you can answer for yourself whether it fits. Mm -hmm. And um, and and honestly, I just want to say this to you, Yasmin, in reading your book, Unveiled, I feel like it, it was just peeling back another layer of understanding of the mm -hmm. magnitude of undue influence. And I relate it to the last two years where I was approached by Cindy Blackstock, who is a social work professor and CEO of the First Nations uh, Children and, and Parents Caring Society in Canada, mm -hmm. dealing with Indigenous people and of course, they had found all these bodies at residential schools. Yeah. And so the last two years, I'm like, oh, my God, the Pope in the 15th century said, issued a doctrine of discovery and said, if you can't convert them, kill them <laughs> as, mm -hmm. as they were colonializing and other mm -hmm. countries were doing it, too. I just didn't understand the magnitude and I've always been using Chinese communist brainwashing as a reference point, but the Catholic Church was doing it hundreds of years earlier. Yeah. And now I understand 
that fundamentalist Islam has been doing it even earlier than that. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm in a learning mode from you, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to offer my framework is really human rights, which means yeah. women's rights, gay rights, indigenous rights, rights of minorities of all types. Mm -hmm. I'm an idealist and I feel like this is really precious and really important yeah. to, to shine a light on this abuse of human rights. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my opener. That's, that's, that's beautiful. You've actually answered a couple of my questions that were coming up. So, so that's great. Um, I definitely agree with you. I, when, even when I'm, watching Leah Remini's documentary about Scientology I'm like this L. Ron Hubbard guy is so much like Muhammad like or so much like Jim Jones like it seems like they all have so many things in common and I'm reading about this you know this moon guy and you know he's, they're all they seem to all follow the same playbook but there is no playbook I don't know how they've all figured out how to hack the human mind they're all copying each other all learning from each other. Um, but but really, you know how you talked about in your book how fear is the major motivator, how the apocalypse is always just around the corner. So you always have to be like, you know, you're gonna die any minute. Like Muhammad said that the the distance between your two fingers, you know, so like basically nothing, like that's how close the apocalypse is. Mm -hmm. Um all of those things, when you talked about decision making, how difficult it was to make decisions, I mean, that was truly the hardest part for me was because I'd never made a decision in my life. I was taught to obey. And as a woman, there's an extra element to that too, right. where you just obey. You, you, you do not think, you do not use your mind, you do not make decisions. And so when I was on my own with me and my daughter, just the most mundane things that other people wouldn't struggle with because they're used to making small decisions their whole life. Like what clothes to wear? You know, I never got to decide that. Um, I, it was, it was really, really difficult. Yeah. So let me just comment that as a mental health professional, what um, there are two major categories of clients that I see people like yourself who were born into an authoritarian family in an authoritarian religion yeah. um, um, and versus me, I was 19 when I was recruited. So I had a framework of identity and preferences and I knew how to make decisions beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so there was you, anyone who's born or raised in childhood uh, has a much bigger task in terms of finding out who am I, what do I like, what I don't like, is it okay for me to do X, Y, or Z? Yeah. Um, it's and 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 people need to know what's normal. And yep. and I do want to say back to your cult, you know, leader playbook thing that we we now see the the universal profile of of mind control cult leaders is malignant narcissism uh -huh. which isn't just narcissism and narcissism is on a continuum but malignant narcissism by the way eric Fromm is the person uh the social psychologist who invented this term but the malignant part they think they're above the law mm -hmm. they're pathological liars they mm -hmm. sadistic paranoid threat you know threaten people harass people silence people so you, there's literally a list on freedomofmind.com under learn about undue influence you can see get a pdf of my influence continuum you can get the the large list of the bite model of mind control and then we have the all the characteristics of malignant narcissists and one more thing i want to add to it is that Way after I got out of the cult, I and and there had been a congressional subcommittee investigation into Korean CIA activities in the United States. There were two high-level people who defected, 
And so there was this congressional investigation that I gave over all my internal documents to and cooperated. But what I came to understand is that the CIA set up the Korean CIA and the, the thinking at that time of the Cold War was kind of the ends justify the means. Well, North Korea is brainwashing people. There have been two coups in South Korea. We need to stabilize it. We need a dictatorship, basically. Mm -hmm. So they set up this intelligence network and they picked a proxy group to be a front for a victory over communism, where they were doing brainwashing wow. of South Korean dissidents. Mm -hmm. And that was the Moonies. Mm -hmm. And then when, when Americans were fed up with being in Vietnam and realized they'd been told a whole host of lies and that innocent people were being killed, et cetera, um, they decided to bring the Moonies to the U.S. to try to counter the protest movement. So that was the context where I was recruited was this effort to try to get right wing college students to say we need more weapons and we need to fight these evil communists. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is, yes, there's religion abuse, mm -hmm. but what we're now the way I think about it is Russia, China, Israel, Iran, all the major uh, state government, the United States, of course, have been researching mind control and brainwashing, MK Ultra, et cetera. Uh, and they haven't told the public this exists, that's real, that people's minds can be hacked, except mm -hmm. you can look at politics and go, holy mackerel, people believe lies and they're mm -hmm. confident about them. And it's a demonstration of just how big the the you with the digital world that we live in, and how inter, the internet platforms are not protecting people's well being. They want to make us addicted and and sell mm -hmm. advertising time, right? Um, that people are people are getting brainwashed online. And uh, and they're losing their soul. They're losing their conscience. They're like, wait a minute. I'm sitting with my friends and everybody's on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Like, tur turn off your phones and like be a human being with each other. Like that's <laughs> that's reality. Digital reality. I mean, I, I, I love that I'm talking to you yeah. now, but it's not the same as being in the real world with you. It's it's definitely not the same. Um, and also, I think that you and I were lucky enough to live in a world where we didn't have these devices in our faces all the time. We didn't have this crutch. So we learned how to connect with each other and understand each other and to feel each other's energy and in a way that that you lose that when you're just text messaging or, you know, sending emojis or whatever, you're not getting that human connection in a genuine way. It's just, uh, it's just exactly. a 2D fake. Yeah. Yeah. And I did an interview for my podcast with a very uh, renowned Harvard psychiatrist and social neuroscientist who published a book called Rewired, Protecting Your Brain in the Digital Age. And and it's a very important book because he goes through all the research of all the deleterious effects on the human mind, starting with babies mm -hmm. and, and the research and the, uh, I think it's the American Academy of Pediatricians says, don't let your kids under three. So crazy. With, you have to say that screens. under three. Yeah. And, yeah. and limit and monitor where they're going because there's so many bad actors on the internet, predators, yeah. sexual stalkers, traffickers, as well as extremist groups recruiting. Mm -hmm. So the human mind did not evolve to be online. This is mm -hmm. a new thing that we're living through, and we have to start using wisdom in making decisions and not just like, what can we make the most amount of money from mm -hmm. or what we can do to you know manipulate votes. Yeah. And that's really kind of where I wanted to bring this conversation because you were talking about um, bringing in the Moonies to counter communists. And that's what happened in Iran, too. That's how we ended up with the Islamic Republic of Iran. It was to push out the, the, the left 
wing, the, the communists and the socialists in Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, so they were supported by Carter. It was a very, you know, it was it was a strategic thing. Same thing in Afghanistan. The Mujahideen there were being supported because it was fighting against Russia. Um, so they were supported by the CIA. So the, the whole thing is, it, it kind of feels like cults are not even... <laughs> Like they're just like this sweet little problem at this point when you expand it and think about this malignant narcissist personality that you're talking about is now a a, a government. Yep. It's now a corporation. It's now a, you know what I mean? It's just exactly. it's, gotten, it's it's so much scarier. And we are terrifyingly fragile. Like we are so easily hacked. You know, I spent a lot if of we years, don't know what if we don't if we know don't how know. to protect ourselves. Yeah, the, if we're the not truth is, is we're very strong as human beings, and people like yourself are the case example of strength, courage, spirit, creativity, uh, yeah, compassion, it's... empathy, all the wonderful things that was kept, you know down in your life until you realize I don't want to live this way. And I, and another thing when reading your book, and this is a universal that I've seen over 45 years is when people become parents yeah, and then they start looking at their little child. Do I want to beat my child the way I was beaten? No, yeah. it starts the process. And by the way, corporal punishment, we know does brain damage. Oh, like good. it's been studied it mm. is not healthy. It should it should be abolished in every country of the world. Um, it's it trains obedience because people mm-hmm. are fearful of mm-hmm. getting hit with a club or a hand or a belt or whatever. But it's not conducive to growing compassionate and empathetic people who care about themselves, who like themselves Mm -hmm. and, and have good relationships that are healthy. Yeah, Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, You know, when you were talking now, you're, you're reminding me of another quote that you had in your book that I wanted to, to bring back. It was, it's about the mind where you said the mind, despite all of its strength and ability has weaknesses too. It's dependent on a stream of coherent information for it to function properly. Put a person in a sensory deprivation chamber and and within hours, he will start to hallucinate and become incredibly suggestible. Likewise, put a person into a situation where his senses are overloaded with non-coherent information and the mind will go numb. My God, I felt every word of this as a protective mechanism. It gets confused and overwhelmed and critical faculties no longer work properly. It is in this weakened state that people become very suggestible to others. Let's talk about this sensory deprivation chamber that I was forced to wear head to toe in black. That is a sensory deprivation chamber. I couldn't see properly. I couldn't hear properly. I couldn't speak properly. I couldn't even feel things properly because they put gloves on me as well. This isn't just like all the girls in Afghanistan that aren't allowed to go to school right now that are being forced to dress like this women in Saudi Arabia, women all over the world. Right. When we are wrapped up like that, it is like people think, Oh, it's just a piece of cloth, but this is explaining how that kind of that control of your body just is one step closer to controlling your mind. Um, And when you said here that the mind goes numb, I physically felt critical thinking for the first time. I know that sounds crazy, but I felt it. It was exhilarating. It was like, it's like getting, it's like being intoxicated, you know, like you get drunk and you like feel different. That's what it felt like when I was able to use my mind I wasn't, I, it was numb. I I didn't use it because using it only brought me turmoil. It brought me depression. It brought me sadness. It brought me anger. It brought me resentment. So I stopped using it. You just go numb. You have to go numb. It's survival. It's survival. It really is. And you use the elephant story uh, about how a young elephant can be trained uh, mm-hmm. to believe that it can't break through its little chain when it grows up 
because of mm-hmm. cycle it be, it's learned helplessness in a sense right yeah yeah but um i just i just want to compliment you again like you're living proof that if anyone's listening to this and thinking oh it's hopeless so and so will never wake up they're they've been brainwashed and they'll never come to their sense it's just not true but critical things well and you said in your book meeting outsiders who are kind and thoughtful and they're supposed to be evil yeah but you found them warm and thoughtful Mm -hmm. and respectful and i can't tell you how many of the people that i've worked with over decades say the same story the neo-nazi who has the jewish Mm -hmm. employer who offers him half of his sandwich because he sees he doesn't have any lunch Mm -hmm. and it starts the dissonance of wait a minute yeah jews are supposed to be selfish and evil and this and that and he's being nice to me what's up with this the black woman at mcdonald's when i go smiles at me and is warm to me when my own people are so angry and hateful and Mm -hmm. it and then when he had a kid it was like okay time to leave yeah Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting how many people I've spoken to over the years who've also told me that having the kid made a big difference. And it wasn't just people leaving Islam. It was this one woman who um, she's Jewish, but she was born and raised in Russia. So she was that she was lucky to have sort of her Jewish community so she could separate herself Mm. from the the propaganda around her but once she had a daughter and her daughter started to go to school and coming home and talking about how much she loves grandpa grandpa stalin she was like okay (laughs) we got to get out of this country now i want to share a quick story so when the soviet union fell Mm -hmm. i was asked to come to moscow to teach about cult mind control because every Western cult in the world was going into Russia to recruit all the vulnerable population. So I'm I'm teaching wow. psychologists, psychiatrists about my models. And the they're looking at me going, uh, Dr. Hassan, do you understand you're describing the whole system of pedagogy of the Soviet Union? Mm. Do you understand we would put dissidents in psychiatric facilities because they were mm. questioning the regime? Oh, you are counseling us. To which I said, if the shoe fits, like <laughs> this is the model. Yeah, but really, yeah. people who are raised in in totalitarian societies are like cult members, but yeah. a political cult, not a religious yeah. cult. Yeah, yeah. And one of the um, the keys that you spoke about in your in one of your chapters, the keys to getting out. Um, I think it was key number seven or something, but it was the one about basically envisioning a life for yourself outside of this world. Um, So a lot of us did that as well. So a lot of us left for our kids and a lot of us did that because left because we were always envisioning something more that we deserved more. Um, Whether it's something as simple as, you know, choosing the man that you marry or choosing to get a job or, you know, choosing to get an education, like we, we, you would dream these things. And we, we kind of, I know in my book, I talked about how I would have these visions of the apartment that I would live in when I would get out and when I would be free. And I didn't know that at that time I was basically visualizing for myself a happier future. And Quite often, I I almost hated that spark inside of me, that fire that just wouldn't just wouldn't suppress itself, wouldn't submit, as per the definition of the word Islam, um, because I felt like I I wasn't conforming, you know, and so I wasn't making my family proud, and I wasn't being a good Muslim, and and so I wanted to suppress that part of myself. But for whatever reason, I don't know why I knew that I needed that part of myself and I knew that I needed to keep it alive. But 
Yeah, so I want to comment exactly on this point. And um, all I can say is it's my experience and my belief that people are born with an authentic self. And for myself, I, I think of myself as a spiritual person, a spiritual essence of our potentiality, if you will. And when you're raised in a cult, you're you're cloned in the image of the cult or in mm -hmm. the image of the cult leader, but your authentic self is still there. It's just suppressed. Mm -hmm. And and so there's this dual identity. And uh, I'll speak as John, a mental John. health professional. Right. It's a dissociative mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. In my case, I had Steve Hassan, the poet, Steve Hassan, the Mooney. So I once I, I stopped doing thought stopping, once I had sleep, once I had exposure to other former members, and I saw they weren't drooling at the mouth and have horns, because the ex-members mm -hmm. who were doing my deprogramming were kind, loving, thoughtful, smart people. Mm -hmm. So the po point I'm trying to say is that I really, it was your cult identity that was angry that you wanted to be free that your, yeah. your authentic self wanted to be free and thank goodness uh you won yeah yeah um so for our listeners today who are kind of because there's a lot of people in muslim majority countries who have to live a double life so women that have to wear hijab men that have to go to the mosque everybody has to listen to the the prayers, you know, five times a day from the loudspeakers. Um, what was the word that you called it? Floating. So it kind of, or triggering, I guess, is kind of how I was, how we always referred to it. But I guess that's just the pop psychology thing. But they're immersed in this all the time. They have to use the jargon of the, uh, of the cult. So their authentic self is really buried under there and can't show itself. Um, and so they, they're they always dealing with that um, dissociative disorder that you were talking about. Like, it's almost like they have to find a comfort zone within being two completely different individuals. And that's really a mouthful because when I had to fake hijab during the day and then take it off at night when I went clubbing with my friends, like, it made me physically ill. Like I, I hated it so much. I felt so, um, I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, if they kill me, they kill me. I mm -hmm. I'm done. I can't, I can't live like this anymore. So it's really difficult to have to fake who you are, but you know, yeah, these, think these, about all the gay people in homophobic exactly. religions and churches and synagogues exactly. and they're not validated as the unique beings that they were born to be and yeah. if you think back over human history some of the greatest minds and greatest inventors were gay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah know, it's just like hmm there's a value to being out of the system mm -hmm. that you're raised in to think differently mm -hmm. and um but I mean, I really, I really am an idealist and I don't, I, I think about religion and I think about it on a continuum. I try to avoid all or nothing characterizations because, for mm -hmm. example, I belong to a progressive Jewish uh, temple with a female rabbi and in Israel, they don't respect anyone except orthodoxy. Yeah. So, you know, they don't like women praying by the wall, the Western wall, et cetera. We're gay friendly. We're progressive. We do social justice. And half the congregation doesn't believe in God, but it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. We mm -hmm. love the culture. We love the traditions. We love the community. We love to be there for each other. Personally, I love singing. I love the praying. I love studying Torah. Mm -hmm. But the way we study Torah isn't to take it literally. because mm -hmm. and, and that's where a lot of fundamentalists get it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Torah has been supplemented by rabbinic interpretations for hundreds of years and in the jewish tradition they fight with each other theologically of what the meaning of the text is 
Mm-hmm. And the way I was taught is we we should reinterpret it the way it fits for us in the modern day. So it's not this, you know, encased in concrete from, you know, thousands of years ago or 700 years ago. It's a living, breathing thing that we choose to use to live a better life. So that's my little speech about that. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with that. And I think that's a very sort of evolved way of, of looking at things. Um, I really hope that one day um, Muslims are living in a world where they are allowed to think and feel differently than than what is what is prescribed of them. Um, but unfortunately, as it as it is right now, that's uh well, especially in the state uh run countries where yeah. Sharia law is the law, you know, that's yeah. that's just oppressive. Um yeah. but I I I I'm always looking at situations and thinking, how can I help improve it versus mm-hmm. just labeling it yes. and saying it, you know, that they're evil forever. I was considered evil by a lot of people when I was mm-hmm. a Mooney. I was a right wing fascist who thought that, you know, we should, you know, infiltrate the government, etc. I wasn't a bad person, but I had mm-hmm. really toxic indoctrination. Mm-hmm. And that's I one don't... reason why I'm so confident in helping people get out of things, just how far gone I was. Yes, that is a huge thing like when in your book you spoke about I forgot his name but your mentor and how he said to you like this is all theoretical for me you know whereas for you this is real like you lived this and that gives you a level of empathy and understanding that you can't get in a book I mean you can tell by reading your reading your words it you you get it in a way that somebody who studied this wouldn't be able to get it they just wouldn't be able to i mean that's not a judgment on them it's just like that's that's just human nature no his name was robert j lifton he's written many different important books about losing reality destroying the world to save it there's many many books but he changed my life because i i i called him up he was at yale and I said, Dr. Lifton, your book saved my life. He said, which book? Oh. And I said, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. No kidding. He said, that old book? Mm. Why? And I said, I was in the Moonies. Da, 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 da. I really would like to tell you about my experiences. So he said, yeah, come, come over. And so I'm telling him what, what was done to me and what I did to other people. And he he looked me in the eyes and he, like you said, he said, you know, I've just learned this secondhand, but you've yeah. lived it. They did it to you and you did it to other people. And what you're describing is far more sophisticated than what I studied. You should study psychology. And there I was with a cast from my toes to my groin with my crutches, college dropout, ashamed, embarrassed confused like who am i what do i believe now like i had to start over again like what do i believe anyway he he did what's called a therapeutic reframe <laughs> so it's like wait a minute what i went through actually can help other people mm. i can i can yeah go with that so when i went yeah. back to college i studied psychology instead of creative writing yeah that's that's kind of what I I did as well, but of course a much longer road before I got here. But that feeling of helping others through what you have been through is is healing for you as well. Um, and for me, it it sort of placated my survivor's guilt because when, every time I'd read about another honor killing or you know it was just like I I felt so grateful. I knew it could have been me. That could have been mm-hmm. my name or my face on that pa- newspaper um, or probably wouldn't have even made so it. You, to the paper you, you have empathy. You put yourself in other people's shoes and you can imagine that that's I, I'm very empathetic. When I saw the, the bodies face down in the jungles of Guyana in the Jonestown cult, I had never heard of the People's Temple. But mm. when I saw that on TV, my first thought was I could have done that. Yeah. Yeah. When I saw the planes going into the World Trade Center, my first thought was I could have done that. 
And that's terrifying. It is so terrifying, but it's it's like, you don't want to get conf- like, you don't want to confuse people, but honestly, it, it's like what you just said a moment ago. These are not bad people. Their minds have just been poisoned by some toxic ideology. And how do you explain to somebody that a person who murders innocent people through flying a plane into a building or a suicide vest or whatever means they want to do it, they think that they are the best of humanity. They think that they are doing God's work. They think that they are going to go to the, you know, the highest levels of heaven. Um, Of course, that's the that's your you're indoctrinated you're indoctrinated and (laughs) but we're living proof that it's not permanent and that the human spirit wants to be free likes to be loved and have empathy and do meaningful work and have real connections and that you tune into your intuition and your conscience i remember in your book you were talking about i think your daughter was ill and -hmm. you knew what yeah. she needed, but the doctors were like, no, you can't do that. And you're like, yeah. no. And then you said, yeah, actually it, it's the best thing to hold your yeah. child if they have yeah. done this. I still feel so vindicated over that. <laughs> but she these are validating terrible. things that yeah. these, this is, this is, you know, for you to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. I should trust my ability to discern. Yeah. And as good. you know, you are not allowed, you don't listen to your inner self. You don't listen to your guts. You don't listen to your mind. You don't listen to your heart. You listen to what you're told to do, to what, you know, you have to obey. Um, And so that did take a lot of, um, you know, so many different experiences like that for me to finally say, okay, you know what, maybe I do know what I'm talking about. Maybe my gut is actually right about some things. Um, Yeah. And you went to school and you found out you're wicked smart. (laughs) yeah I mean you you grow up your whole life being told one thing um but yeah was because I'd had so many huge gaps in my education I always felt like I was struggling I always felt like I was behind and so once I realized that I was on par with my peers and in fact sometimes you know um you know even going even further I started to like hey wait a minute maybe I'm not as you know useless and stupid as they always tried to convince me that I was and yeah, that's you a, had a horrible thing. family upbringing oh my god and I did but turned upside down and beaten on the bottom yeah. of your feet that's torture that's yeah they sh- that guy should be arrested and put in jail well, according to the Canadian government that's just uh that's just my culture so that's my well luck. that's where I'm trying to but up against the existing systems and say, hey, actually, we have laws against trafficking, sex and labor trafficking. Let's look at fraud, force or coercion and let's apply it to any context because Mm -hmm. it's a human rights violation. That's what my whole doctoral dissertation was attempting Mm -hmm. to do is to say this is science now. This isn't just anecdotal stories about mind control. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a world right now where people are being deliberately polarized against each other Mm -hmm. and information warfare and and cyber warfare by Mm -hmm. authoritarians that want to distract us from, Mm -hmm. you know, just using oil frivolously, not caring about the planet and the pollution that's taking place that we could totally change if we are free to Mm -hmm. exercise our understanding Mm -hmm. or maybe it's just to make money off of us like there's all different whatever their motivations are but at the end of the day it's not because they care about us or because they want what's best for us so social media is really scary in that way Um, but you know doing things like this like getting our voices out there reaching Saudi Arabia reaching Somalia reaching Pakistan you know what I mean Totally. That's why I'm so excited that you asked me to do this. Yeah. And I'm hoping anyone who listens, you know, comes to my website and starts looking at all the interviews I've been doing with people who are raised in all other types of cults 
Because the thing about recovery is it's easier to see how abusive yeah. another group is, and then you can apply it to your own situation. Absolutely correct. You, you, don't, you don't trigger your cult identity and all the defenses that were programmed in. But then you you can go, wait a minute, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not allowed to get blood transfusions. What happens if your kid, you know, need, needs a blood transfusion? They die. Yeah. Well, yeah. They didn't tell me that when they knocked on my door and said they mm -hmm. want to study the Bible with me. Like, mm -hmm. that's not okay. Or they had a pedophile. That 35,000 pedophiles right. lists at their headquarters but they have a rule that in, in the Bible, it says you need two witnesses to the abuse. Otherwise, it, there's no abuse. Huh? Nobody Amazing. interprets scripture that way. Either. In Islam, it's four witnesses. So there's actually countries today that when a woman like this just happened in Qatar mm. for the 2022 uh, World Cup. Mm. It was a, a woman from Mexico that went there working for FIFA and she was raped. And when she went to the police, they said, unless you can bring four witnesses, you're trying to mar the name of a good man. And therefore you were the one who was engaging in premarital sex. And now you're the one who's going to be imprisoned. Luckily, Mexico was able to get her out. But that's the kind, that's the reason why there are no statistics for rape in a lot of these countries because women don't come forward because of co who's going to have four witnesses. If you have four witnesses, that was a gang rape and they were all in on it. So nobody's going to be telling on anybody. That's so right. And now let's call out the patriarchy and how mm -hmm. women have been suppressed for thousands of years. Yeah. And as a white privileged male, you know, I think it's horrible. Yeah, but we are be. doing our we're doing our part. And um, like we were like us right now using this this medium, which can be used for evil. We're using it for good. Um, and you're always talking about the resilience of the human spirit. And you're absolutely correct. And that's why I have um, the conversations with women. It's called Forgotten Feminists, where they all talk about the what they've overcome. And through hearing the stories of other people, it will empower others to feel like, hey, I can I can also do this. You know, if she can do it, I can do it. She's had way more obstacles than I did. And so therefore, you know, it's possible. And part of mind controlling people is making them feel like any problem is your fault. Um, so it's always turned back on you. So when people are starting to wake up, they have to get over that programmed thing of I'm not good enough or there's something I did wrong in it. Step out, get a perspective, right? Mm -hmm. The cure to blind faith is perspective mm -hmm. and, and make other choices that mm -hmm. are based on like humanity. Yeah, yeah. That that is it's that's really the internet is really helping with that when you're living in a society that it's so closed and all of your media and your education, your government, everything is all singing the same tune. So now with uh, with these conversations and you know with everything else that's that's out there these days, people can get access to information, get access to different narratives. Um, so it will allow yeah, them to get that, that perspective. You're not alone. Yeah. You, you don't need to suffer in 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 and believe that you're the one who's crazy. You're the yeah. one who's got the problem. No. Yeah. This is a big problem. Millions yeah. of people are in the same boat with this type of totalist mm -hmm. control of behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions to make mm -hmm. a pseudo self that's in the image of the cult or in the mm -hmm. in, you know clone of the leader. Or the ideology. In fact, the, those people that they're being told that they're not strong enough, or they're not smart enough, or they're not their, their faith isn't strong enough, or whatever, and they're being degraded for that. Those, in fact, are the smartest people and the kindest people and the you know the the best people, the ones that are able to somehow see past mm. all of this indoctrination. <clears throat> so it, it's like they've they've taken the positive part of these people and they've turned that into the negative but you know your book is really good for reminding people i love the john john analogy for those of you who don't know what i'm referring to you're gonna have to pick up the book but it was really really helpful um to 
because that's kind of what it was like for me. You know, we all have that little person inside of us, your authentic self. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of just allowing that person to flourish and not being, um, you know, not allowing all of these fears and threats yeah. and everything else, lies mostly get in the way and, and just find your authentic self and go after your own freedom and your own happiness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, one, yeah. one more addendum before we go. Um, so my book, when it first came out, had two T's and combating and yeah. the new one has one T. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is thinking about reading combating, uh, if it's in your library, it's free. Uh, it's on uh, digital as well as audio versions. And if you just don't have the money, but you want to read it, email my center and we'll send it out to you because, you know, the truth will set you free. Yeah. If, you, if you understand this stuff, it's like so yeah. many people have said, your book, you know, changed everything. I was, yeah. Born. And it's like, I'm so glad that my life work is, is going out. Yeah. It's you can take that feeling. negative, incredibly negative, dark experience. And then, you know, you, you said after when you found out what a hypocrite he was, you said that you went through the most difficult time of your life. It was the most painful experience to find out that you'd been lied to like that. Um, for somebody that you devoted so much, I've been your time lied and energy. to, but then I lied for him. Yeah, yeah, and and hurt so people. many other people, my family and friends included, because of course I try to recruit them. And then when they didn't come, I did the curse. You know, your mom with you were talking about how your mom cursed cursed mm. you and everything. Do the curse. You're gonna rot in hell and regret it for eternity if you don't come to the workshop. And mm -hmm. it's just I felt awful. And I just could say, I'm so sorry. I thought I was doing a good thing. Please forgive me. And I promise I'll never do anything remotely like that again. And if you ever see me getting involved with anything or saying anything that you don't agree with or you think is wrong, please bring it to my attention. Mm -hmm. I promise yeah. I'll listen and I'll reality test it. Yeah. Well, you absolutely will. You will more than anybody else, you see, because <laughs> you've been through this experience. So from now on, your your eyes are wide open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I'm going to need to go soon, Yasmin, yeah. unfortunately, but yeah, I'm looking no, forward course. to our next conversation on my podcast because I want to yeah. bring you to my audience. And okay. uh, of course, we'll share the links to my audience of this because I think mm -hmm. we covered a lot of important points. And I just mm -hmm. want to add my voice of support for women all over the world who are oppressed and anyone who's in a religious group that oppresses their true self, like find your power, connect with others, feed your mind with information and, and, and that you can use to think and evaluate because mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. is precious. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. I really Thank appreciated you. you spending this time with me and, uh, and I look forward to coming on to your podcast as well. Great. Thank you Thanks. for everyone for joining us.